Thanks so much. Pass it yeah. over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to, you know, be here talking to you guys. Um, so yeah, today is Arbor Day. So happy Arbor Day, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go through a brief, like how to plant trees, how to care for your trees, why we want trees. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat and just like stop me as I'm going. I'm happy to answer questions during the presentation or at the end. Sorry about my cat. So the New Jersey Tree Foundation, we were formed in 1998. So we're 23 years old now. Um, we've got a couple different programs. Our urban airshed reforestation program is the one based in South Jersey, um, specifically in Camden. Uh, Renaissance Trees program is my program. Uh, we do mostly North Jersey, but other places as well. We have our Green Streets program, uh, which is a contract program, and then the Grove of Remembrance. And I have some slides later. So the urban airshed reforestation, like I mentioned, this is Camden. This is our oldest program. So we've planted over 7,000 trees in Camden at this point. Um, uh, yeah, and just a nice little before and after. Before trees and then after, now they look nice. the Renaissance Trees Program. So that's mine. So we're based in Newark. This one we started a little later in 2006. We planted over 3,400 trees here. So we're based in Newark, but we kind of plant everywhere, um, which is why last fall I was planting in Atlantic City. Uh, our, when we plant in cities that aren't Newark, it's based on grant funding. So if we're able to find a grant for another city, then we'll plant there. Otherwise we stick to Newark. So I'm kind of all over the place, but it's fun. And uh, this program and our Camden program, they're volunteer like community planting programs. So we actually work with residents and the city or like a school, um, you know, people who actually live there and they reach out to us because they want trees on their block or around their school or in their park. Um, and we actually will work with them to help get other residents on the block involved and we have like a 10 tree minimum. So we'll end up planting like 10 to 15 trees on a block and all the neighbors come out, we get volunteers from everywhere. So it's really like a whole community effort. It's not like we're just going in and like popping trees in the ground. Um, everyone gets involved. Our Green Streets program is a contract program. Uh, so we hire men who are under parole supervision. Um, this is not a volunteer program. This is like municipalities will hire us to plant trees, usually like in their parks, sometimes along the streets. Uh, the guys will work with us for a season. Sometimes they stay on for more than one season and it just helps them get like reacclimated to the workforce, provide some job training. Um, it's a really good program and they plant a lot of trees. <laughs> We also, if you ever head up to Liberty State Park, we have the Grove of Remembrance. So we planted one tree for every New Jersey resident uh, who was a victim of 9-11. So we've got over 750 trees there. We also have like a memorial tree program if you want to like plant a tree in memory of someone. So we have planted that, we maintain it every year. Here are just some more pictures of our grove. We also do green infrastructure projects occasionally. And again, that's usually the Green Streets crew um, helps with this. We'll, they'll also do rain gardens, uh, rain garden maintenance or tree pit maintenance, you know, making it look nice. More maintenance. So why do we want to plant trees? You know, we all know they look nice, um, but in addition to that, they're a really good way to solve a lot of problems with one easy solution. So first of all, you know, they produce oxygen. We literally need trees and plants to breathe. Um, and in producing oxygen, they're also absorbing carbon dioxide. So that's helping to mitigate climate change as well. So double bonus. Um, they filter out pollutants from the air and the water. Uh, they both take them in and then, you know, as rainwater falls down, the tree roots absorb it, they use it and prevents it from getting to the groundwater. They absorb the stormwater, uh, which is really important in flood areas, like especially when we're planting in Atlantic City. 
um, you know, they definitely have a flooding problem there. So the trees will help to absorb the stormwater and reduce runoff. They create shade, uh, which is always nice, especially in our urban areas where it's mostly just buildings and on like hot summer days, it's really hot. There's nowhere to like relax in the shade. If you're like walking down the street, it can get to be a lot like in the sun. So planting trees along the street, not only it looks nice, but it creates places for people to like hang out and relax. Um, they, uh, studies have shown that they also reduce anxiety, improve happiness, um, and of course they provide provide food and habitat for wildlife, uh, including pollinators, especially when you plant native. So our motto at the New Jersey Tree Foundation is we want to plant the right tree in the right place in the right way. Um, a big problem that a lot of cities have is that you plant, they planted, or maybe <laughs> the trees were probably here before the sidewalk, you see like these giant oak trees on the sidewalk and they're kind of lifting the sidewalk, they need to be pruned a lot because they're getting into the wires. So when we're planting trees along the streets, we're not planting trees that are gonna get that big. We wanna make sure we're selecting the right species for that specific space. Um, so that later on, it's not gonna cause any problems and the tree is gonna do well. So the first rule of this is obviously we wanna plant the right tree. Like I was saying, we need to be aware of how much space we have we're not going to plant huge trees under wires just so it can get pruned when it's uh, an older tree. So when you're picking your tree, you also want to make sure you're getting a good tree. So the tree that we have here, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, like this is a, a good looking tree. Like it's straight, it's got only one leader, its branches are all nice, it's nicely leafed out, that's a good tree. And obviously we want to avoid planting invasive species because they have a tendency to take over wherever they're planted or in other areas where they weren't planted. Um, so native species are ideal. Um, they obviously provide the most food for pollinators. They tend to be preferred by insects or birds, but non-native non-invasive species are okay. Um, I would rather you know, if someone really, really wants a cherry tree and, you know, they don't want any other type of tree, the cherry tree is an invasive. It's not from the U.S., but it's better for them to have, in my opinion, a non-invasive, non-native tree than no tree at all. So it's okay if you want to plant some non-native ones, but for biodiversity's sake, native ones are the best way to go if you can. These are the worst offenders. <laughs> Don't feel bad if you have a pear in your yard, but uh, these were planted a lot like over the past several decades. And it's only been kind of recently that we realized that they're really bad trees, but it's too late and they're already everywhere. So the calorie pears, a couple weeks ago, they were blooming. I don't know about along the parkway, but I know along like 295 and the turnpike, I was just seeing like hordes of white flowering trees um, and they were all pears. Um, I don't think they're still flowering. Some of them might be, but basically they're overplanted because we thought that they were good landscape trees. Everyone agreed. So everyone planted them, uh, but they're really weak. So when we've had wind storms like the ones we have today, you know, if we get hurricanes, ice storms, they just break apart. Um, my parents had one in their yard. And over the past few years, it was like every time there was a storm, it lost another limb. And finally, it just fell down. But they're not great. <laughs> and on top of that, they are also exotic invasive species. So Here's an example, uh, looks like right behind a house along this roadway, these pears were intentionally planted and you know, they look fine, whatever. But across the street is a huge grove of wild pear trees because once they spread, they just spread and spread and spread everywhere. They're thorny, when they bloom, they don't smell good either. Um, so they really just kind of take over fields where they end up. They're not great. So if you can, please plant something else. 
Um, instead, you could pick a surface berry. So this is a native species. They also have berries that people can eat and you know, birds love them too. They have flowers, they're small trees. So instead of a pear, if you're gonna plant a tree in your yard, maybe a service berry would be a good option. Another one of the really common landscape species that we see a lot are these purple plums. Um, and they are pretty, the, the purple leaves are very nice, but again, they're not really great trees. They're not native and they're very, very top heavy. So seeing one of these just completely uprooted after a big storm is not rare. You could plant a forest pansy redbud. Uh, redbuds are some of my favorite trees. They have like really cute um, pink flowers on them. And this particular variety has those pretty purple leaves if that's important to you. And again, this is native, so it's really great for biodiversity. Okay, I keep saying diversity <laughs> um, in a biodiversity sense, but it's really important to plant a lot of different species. Uh, if we have all the same species on a block and then some disease or pest comes along that affects that specific species, then you've just lost all your trees on the block or all the trees in the park. So it's really important to plant a wide variety of species so that if something like that happens, it doesn't affect every tree in the area. And also it's, again, just good for nature. You know, different birds or insects prefer different types of trees. So if you want to focus on biodiversity, have some biodiversity in your trees as well. Uh, black gums are really, really pretty. Um, especially in the fall, they turn this really bright red. Again, they're native. It's a mid-sized tree, so it gets bigger than like a little dogwood, but not as big as an oak tree. Uh, Carolina silver bells are native to the southeast U.S. Again, these cute little flowers. If you like flowering trees, there are plenty of options for native trees that aren't just a cherry, because I know those are really popular. Nothing's wrong with cherries, but you do have other options. A uh, hop horn beam, if you're looking for a shade tree, this is another medium sized tree. They've got these cute little seeds that kind of look like hops, which I think is pretty cool. Yellow woods are also native, another medium sized shade tree, and they do have cute flowers. It's not an ornamental tree, but they still do look pretty. Carpinus caroliniana, the American horn beam. Again, this is a smaller shade tree. Um, so if you want a small tree, but you don't necessarily want an ornamental, there are smaller shade trees too. And they have this really cool looking bark that kind of looks like mussels. And that's why it's called a mussel wood. American elms are great. These are a larger tree. So if you've got a big yard or if you are looking to plant in a park, um, an elm is a really good option. Again, it's native. Really great tree. So rule number two for planting is we wanna make sure that we're planting it in the right place. So I mentioned this earlier, we only wanna plant small trees under utility wires. I have some pictures later in the presentation that are the results of pruning when you planted a giant tree underneath utility wires. So we'll see that later. And to avoid that, we can just plant smaller trees. We don't need to plant an oak along the street. So some small trees, I mentioned a couple of these. We've got hornbeams, service berries, uh, hawthorns, they have berries too. Crab apples, you can eat crab apples even though they don't taste great. Um, silver bell, parodia, lilacs, maples, um, and then some cherries too. So if you like maple trees, there are small maples. Oh, here's my utility pruning. Uh, so I'm sure that you all have seen something like this, like the tree just getting cut straight down the middle and that like V shape or worse, like half of the tree just getting shaved off. I think it's obvious that these trees are now unbalanced and they are definitely at a higher risk of coming down in a storm or just kind of coming down on their own because they are not a very well-structured tree anymore. More examples. And it, it doesn't really look nice either. Not only is it not good for the tree, but it's pretty ugly. So again, 
would you rather have this giant V cut tree that hardly even looks like a tree at this point, or we could just plant something smaller in the first place. Wrong place can also be just too close to other things. So if you're planting like right along a fence, right along a house, right along, you know, a street pole, um, the tree might do okay, but it's probably going to need to be pruned um, to get out of the way of the pole or the building that's in the way. We want to make sure they have enough space. So obviously not every space needs a small tree. So if you have, you know, a wide open backyard, you've got plenty of space, then absolutely go for larger trees. Uh, they provide more shade. The environmental benefits that large trees provide is much greater. So whenever possible, it's better to plant large trees. Um, some good options are oaks. Oaks are some of the best for biodiversity. Elms, maples, sweet gums, tulip trees, uh, London plane trees. These are all really, really good options for large trees if you have the space for it. Just a little map, you know, our small trees by the uh, telephone wires, medium trees, and then, you know, when you get closer to the house and you have some more space, you can plant larger trees. And then the third rule, we want to make sure the tree is planted the right way. Trees that are planted incorrectly, um, they generally don't do as well as ones that were planted correctly. So when we say the right way, we want to make sure it's straight. We want to make sure that we can see the root flare, um, which is a little hard to see on this picture, but I have a better picture later on. But that's the part where the tree starts to go out like this. And then we want to make sure the mulch is away from the base of the tree. I have several slides of mulching later, so we'll cover that then. Uh, when you plant, you have two options for trees. Uh, you can either get your tree in a container. In the fall, you're more likely to plant a container tree because some trees are not, they don't respond well to being dug up in the fall and like put in a burlap sack. So those trees would just be in containers from the spring. Um, these are a lot easier to maneuver. They're much, much lighter than B&B &B trees. <laughs> Um, but the problem is that sometimes they can get a little bit pot bound. If you are planting container trees, like they're still good, don't shy away from them. But when you take it out of the container, you might see roots like wrapping around. Even if you don't see roots wrapping around the tree, uh, the soil just might be very compacted. So before you put it in the hole, you can just like hack away all of those roots and soils. Like we literally just take a saw and like slice the edges of the root ball um, before putting it in the hole. And that just helps to make sure the roots will start spreading out into the rest of the ground and not just keep circling the tree. Now B&B trees, um, if you're planting in the spring, you're more likely to find a B&B tree. These ones are much trickier. If you can find a drum laced root ball, which is in this picture here, so there's no metal basket, then you can just like put this tree in and like pull a little bit of the rope off and you're done. <laughs> um, it's harder to find these though. Usually the ones that you find will come in a wire basket such as this. Most of the ones that we plant come in a wire basket. Um, and it is important to remove the wire basket. I'm going to talk about that a little later too. So you're all, you got your tree, you're ready to plant. What's the first thing that you do? All before you dig. <laughs> so it's actually against the law in New Jersey to, um, to dig without doing a one call. So you would just want to mark out the area where you want to plant the tree, even if it's on your yard. You know, and you're pretty sure that you don't have any utilities there, it's always a good idea to just call in a mark out and you can use the website here or they have a phone number you can call and the gas people, the water people, any other utilities that are in that area will come out and they'll mark where those lines are so that you can be sure that when you're digging, you don't run into a gas line or break a water pipe or anything like that. Now, how deep do we want our hole to be? So I mentioned the root flare before. 
Um, it's the part where the tree starts to go out like this. You might see like, you might actually see one of the roots. Um, so we want that to be like level with the ground. Um, a little too high is better than too deep. Uh, too deep is very bad for the tree, but ideally it's going to be like right level with the ground. And here's just a picture. Uh, the root flare is not always at the top, um, whether it's container trees or B and B trees. Sometimes you might have to dig down. Don't just assume that the root flare is at the top of you know wherever the soil ends. That is often not the case. Um, as you can see here, you know the soil it stopped several inches above where the actual root flare was. So it's very very important that before you even measure your hole you actually find that flare. Even if you're planting little saplings, they still have a root flare. Make sure you don't plant these too deep. Right. So once you've found your uh, root flare, then you can measure your hole to decide if it's deep enough, it's not deep, um, or if it's too deep maybe. These trees, especially if you're planting the size trees that we do, which are like two and a half inch caliper, they're very heavy. So you wanna make sure that you measured it correctly before the tree gets in the hole, because it is very hard to take it back out and redig the hole to adjust the depth. So you wanna measure your root ball. Once you find your root flare, then Usually we'll stick a shovel like upside down. Do I think I have a slide on this? Yeah. Um, so we want it to be approximately as large as the root ball. But again, make sure that you find that root flare first because it might not be right at the top there. It might be a couple inches down and that's where you're gonna wanna measure from. So the way that we do it is we use two shovels to measure. So first, we're going to dig our hole to what we think is approximately the right depth. Then you get in the hole and literally just like jump all over it, stomp it down, and that's going to make it nice and flat because we don't want to put the tree in there and have the dirt sink. Then we take one shovel, lay it across the hole. Then you're going to take your second shovel, <laughs> turn it upside down, and like measure it against the root ball. So the bottom of the shovel handle should be at the bottom of the root ball. And then you're gonna grab the shovel approximately where the root flare is. So usually it's like a foot, foot and a half or so. Um, and then, you know, you go over your hole, make sure that you don't let go of the shovel, keep your hands where it is. And then put your shovel in the hole. And if it's even, your hand should meet the shovel that's laying across the hole. Um, if your hand is way above the shovel that's laying across the hole, then you need to go deeper. If your hand's way below, you need to backfill some in. And then how wide should you dig? Um, this is definitely a wide enough hole. That's a good example. Um, make it as wide as you can, really. These trees are big, and once they're in the hole, we need to kind of maneuver them and like wiggle them a little bit, make sure they're straight. So it's good to be at least like one and a half to two times the, the width of the root ball itself, and that'll give you some room to maneuver it. And if you're doing a B&B &B tree, that's going to give you room to take the basket off. So should you remove this basket? Um, some people say that you can keep it on, but most experts say that you should take it off. Uh, we always take our baskets off. Uh, we don't want them to end up inter interfering with the roots later on. You can leave the burlap. The burlap, um, as long as it's like untreated, it'll just biodegrade. It won't hurt the, um, it won't hurt the tree. So you can just like tuck it underneath but we definitely want to take off any uh, metal baskets and like any string. Usually they're tied up with some string. How do we do this? Another very important note, you don't want to take the whole basket off before the tree is in the hole. 
um, because if you do that, then the burlap sack will just kind of fall apart and that's a big mess. So you want to keep the basket on until it's in the hole. But first, we want to take off the bottom of the basket because there's going to be no way to get that off once the tree's in the hole. So we'll usually clip like all of the um, like vertical bars on like the bottom rung of the basket and then literally just like pull it off the bottom and it looks like a little sun, like a little circle. And then we'll, we'll clip up just in one area. So we'll clip the horizontal bars, uh, but just, just in one row. And then we'll fold it back so that when it's in the hole, we can hopefully reach in and grab the basket and pull it off. Um, but so right now we've got the bottom clipped off and we've made one clip up on the horizontal bars then you can roll the tree into the hole. Uh, with the larger trees, it's definitely more than a one person job, two to three people you might need. You just kind of lean it back, one person steers, one or two people will roll it and you roll it right into the hole. Then you wanna make sure it is straight. Um, so when we do this, we look at it like head on, like from a 90 degree angle. You don't wanna be standing to the side and just make sure it's straight up and down, not leaning one way or the other. And you also want to uh, make sure it's like in the center of the pit, not like if you're doing a street tree, if you're in your yard, it doesn't really matter as much, I guess, but make sure it's where you want it to be. <laughs> um, yeah. And then once our tree's in the hole, then we can remove the rest of the basket. So, you know, I mentioned we usually will fold back a little piece of the basket and then ideally you can just reach in, grab off that part that you folded back and like pull it off. Like it comes off like a jacket. Doesn't always work out that way. You might need to make a couple extra clips, um, but <laughs> ideally, like, especially if your hole is wide enough, then it should be pretty easy to just pull it off. Take off any rope that's in the, um, that's holding up the basket. And then, like I said, the burlap, if it's untreated burlap, it won't harm the tree, um, it biodegrades. So you can just tuck that all, tuck that underneath, uh, pile some soil on top of it. If it's a lot of burlap, you might wanna cut off a little bit extra, um, but it's okay, it won't hurt the tree. And again, you know, we measured before, but check the depth again. Um, like I said, slightly too high, is better than too deep. If it's too deep um, and you can't see the root flare, then it kind of like suffocates the tree and can create like a lot of moisture. Um, it's not good. So. All right. So if your tree is centered, it's at the right depth, so it's nice and straight, then it's time to fill it in. So um, we always tell people every couple shovel holes you just want to stop. So, and also while you're doing this, if you've already straightened out your tree, don't like hold the tree while you're putting dirt in the hole. Um, Cause you might end up like moving it and then it'll end up leaning. Um, so don't touch the trunk of the tree while you're filling in the soil. So you just, every couple shovel holes, you can just get your boot in there and stomp it down really hard. It helps remove the air pockets and like stabilize it so that it doesn't wobble or end up leaning. So we've got all our dirt in. The next step, mulching. I mentioned earlier, I have a whole slide on this. <laughs> mulching is very, very important and it is very often done wrong. Um, we say mulch like a donut, not a volcano. So some of you are probably familiar a lot of like landscaping companies, you know, make these giant piles up against the trunk of the tree. Uh, that's not good. That's a, we call them mulch volcanoes. And just like how we don't want soil piled up on the, the root flare, we don't want mulch piled up on the root flare either. It needs to be able to breathe. So we say mulch like a donut, spread it out just like two to three inches deep. We also don't need it like a foot high. 
Um, it's completely unnecessary. Um, you just spread it out and then pull it back a couple inches from the base of the tree and that'll give it room to breathe. Again, none of this. I know that like every landscaping company out there does mulch volcanoes, but please do not do this. It like traps moisture um, against the trunk of the tree and it can promote like bacteria and fungus. It's very bad. Please don't do it. <laughs> All right, staking. You don't always need to stake the tree. Um, we kind of do it on a case by case basis. So sometimes uh, when you plant them for whatever reason, they might have been loose in the container or loose in their ball. So it might be a good idea to stake those. If it starts to lean, you know, stake it as soon as you see it start leaning to help correct it as soon as possible. Um, and areas with high wind too. So like if any of you were at our Atlantic City planting last fall, we staked all those trees right away just because it's a very high wind area. It's right on the water. So we could assume that those trees are probably going to get hit with some high wind. So as a precautionary measure, we'll stake it. But it's not necessary in every situation. So it's like a case by case thing. Here is a well planted tree. <laughs> it's nice and straight. Uh, you can see the mulch is pulled back a little bit from the trunk. We can see the root flare. Good tree. We planted this one last Saturday, actually. Right. And then since you've put all this effort and money into planting your tree, you want to make sure it actually lives, right? So there's five key things that we need to take care of our trees. Water, weeding, mulching, pruning, and protecting your tree. So I'm just going to go through each one of those real quick. Water is probably the most important thing. Um, obviously, trees need water to survive especially within the first few years after you plant them, they lose a lot of root mass when they're transplanted um, from the nursery. So you need to make sure that the trees are getting enough water because they are much less efficient at taking up water like as they're trying to grow out the roots again. Uh, browning, wilting, scorch, and dieback after really hot or cold weather um, are often as a result of not having enough water. At the same time, you also don't want to overwater your tree. You don't want to drown it. Um, there are certain species that do really well with wet feet, but for the most part, we do like to avoid, you know, flooding the trees out if we can help it. Um, if you're not sure, because sometimes it can be hard to tell, get yourself a soil moisture meter, and that'll tell you exactly how much moisture your soil has in it. And, you know, if you need to water more, you need to water less, it's a pretty handy tool, and I don't think they're that expensive. So as a general rule, they need 10 gallons per one inch caliper. So we normally plant two inch caliper trees. Those need 20 gallons a week. If you go a little smaller, 10 gallons a week, a little larger, 30 gallons a week. And the only season we don't water is in the winter. So they're pretty much being watered from March until like October, early November when they lose their leaves. The best way to water, if you can, is to just leave it on like a slow trickle for like 20 to 30 minutes. That would be for 20 gallons. Again, maybe a little bit less time if you've got a smaller tree. Um, another great idea is uh, tree gators. So we use these sometimes. This is the picture on the right. And these are very handy. You can just pop your hose in it, you know, let it fill up for like five to 10 minutes. Uh, and then once the bag is full, then it will slowly release water throughout the week. And these bags hold exactly 20 gallons. So you know exactly how much water your tree is getting and releasing it slowly over the course of the week um, is usually a little better than just like flooding it out all at once. Another option that I have not personally used, but I've seen them and like heard a little bit about them is um, these things called tree diapers, which they actually like harvest rainwater um, and then, you know, hold that in the bag and then slowly release it over time. Um, and I haven't used these yet, but it could be neat if you don't have like 
a readily accessible hose or water source. Weeding is important too, not just because Weeds are kind of ugly, but they do compete with the tree for nutrients and water. Um, plus, you know, a nice clean tree bed always just looks nicer. Um, so you just want to remove any grass or weeds growing in the tree bed. Um, do it by hand. Please don't use weed whackers if you can help it, um, especially like close to the tree. If you wanted to use them further away, you know, whatever. But I've seen a lot of damage on the trunk of the tree from wood, weed whackers or lawn mowers, and that's not good for the tree. So please remove by hand, like right around the trunk, and just be careful with any machinery that you're using. Um, if you want, I don't really like weed fabric, um, but you can use newspaper, which again is biodegradable. You can just lay that down under mulch, and then that'll help suppress weeds. Um, and mulch, also helps to suppress weeds, so. Mulch, we already went through the proper mulching methods, but it also helps to retain moisture, helps to suppress weeds, uh, helps improve like the microorganisms and like the health of the soil, it's organic matter. Um, you don't need to mulch your tree forever. Uh, obviously, when you have like a 50 year old oak tree in your yard, you're probably not mulching it. You don't need to. Although I have seen like very old trees with mulch on them and I don't really know why. Um, but for the first couple of years after you plant your tree, then it's good to, uh, it's good to mulch. Um, I guess you can mulch afterwards if you want, but it's not necessary after the first few years. And then pruning. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about pruning. So pruning just helps to keep the shape of your tree, helps to keep it healthy as well. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're pruning correctly because improper pruning can hurt the tree more than it helps it. Um, a reason we also want to prune young trees is that it's easier to correct the problems while the tree is young as opposed to once it's, you know, 50 feet tall and now you have to come call in a guy to come and trim it for you and take off giant limbs. If you just address the problem while the tree is young, like right after it's planted, then you're less likely to have those problems down the line. Some general pruning rules. The best time to prune is uh, when the trees are dormant. So after they've lost their leaves um, in the fall and then before bud break in the spring. So like December, January, February, great times to prune. You want your tools to be nice and clean and sharp because a sharp pruner is going to make a better cut than a dull one. You never, as a general rule, want to take off more than 25% of the tree at one time um, or really for like the whole year. Like if you were going to prune, don't take off more than 25% over the course of the year. We always say prune when you are happy and not angry uh, because once you like know how to prune and get into it, um, if you're in a bad mood, it could be <laughs> easy to like take your anger out on the tree and just go a little too crazy, um, cutting off some limbs. So do it when you're in a good mood. Again, do not try and prune mature large trees yourself. If you need to be like using chainsaws and getting up on ladders and stuff, please just call someone <laughs> to do it. Um, when I'm talking about pruning here, I'm talking about younger trees that you know you can reach from the ground and using like manual tools. You can also call a New Jersey licensed tree expert. Um, they're usually happy to come out, take a look at your tree, prune it. Um, they're a very good resource. And if your tree is planted near telephone poles, wires, leave it alone. Do not prune that yourself. Um, it's very dangerous. You don't wanna accidentally cut an electrical wire. So I know that I said <laughs> that winter is the best time to prune, but there are some times when you can prune outside of the winter. So during the winter, we would want to do crown raising. So if you have a street tree or if the tree's in your yard and the limbs are just a little too low and you know they're hitting you in the face when you're mowing the lawn or whatever, then you can you can actually limb up the tree a little bit. So that involves just cutting off the lower limbs. Um, and they won't regrow like your tree grows from the top up so you can just cut off the lower limbs and like slowly raise the crown 
and then anything that's like crossing each other um you would want like if there's two branches like this you would probably want to take off the smaller branch of those two because again when the tree is all grown up you know 50 years later those crossing branches could become a hazard so it's better to just fix it when you first see it but any time of year, you can take off dead, damaged, or diseased branches as soon as you see them, you know, if the tree is cracked, if it seems like it, you know, has like a fungus or like something weird on it, just take it off. It's fine. Um, sprouts and suckers, I think I have a photo of these, but um, some trees you might see little like shoots going up from the ground or like the lower portion of the trunk. Those are called suckers or water sprouts, and they show up when the tree is stressed. So those you can just take off any time. They will probably keep coming back year after year. As soon as you see them, just take them off. Otherwise, they will just keep getting bigger and bigger, um, and it, it becomes unmanageable. And anything that's like a pedestrian or a property hazard. So if there's a branch and it looks like, you know, it might fall on your house, or if it's like blocking the sidewalk, um, just take it off right away. Yes, so here are the suckers that I mentioned. Um, they're pretty common. You, I'm sure that you've seen them. Um, they just pop up around the base of the tree, sometimes a little further up on the trunk, but like in the lower portion of the trunk. So those can be taken off anytime. Anything dead, disease, damage, like I mentioned, um, or if you have like multiple leaders. So in most trees, you want to just have one straight, like main trunk. Sometimes they will kind of split or you have like one that's like a little bit bigger than the other one. Um, and I do have a picture of this later on, so you'll see this. Um, you wanna take off whichever one is not dominant. So whichever one's a little bit smaller or has like not as good structure because ideally we're just gonna have one main trunk. So like I said, if you don't take care of those suckers when they're young, then they become this. It basically looks like it's almost another tree. So at this point, you know, taking that off might actually cause some significant stress to the tree. Whereas if you took it off when it was, you know, just a little twig, then you're gonna do a lot less damage for the tree. The proper pruning cuts, um, we want to cut just outside of the branch collar. So there should be, when you're looking at the branch, there's usually a little ridge that's called the branch bark ridge. Um, and then there's like the branch collar, which I mean, it kind of like looks like a collar of a shirt, I guess, <laughs> like a little bump. And then the branch goes out from that bump. So we don't actually want to cut into the collar. We want to cut just outside of it. And you definitely don't want to be cutting into the ridge. So you should still, after the branch is pruned, you should be able to see the ridge still and like still see the collar. You don't want to be like cutting flush up against the trunk. For larger branches, we do what's called the three cut method. So if we just were to cut, you know, make our one cut, you know, right next to the trunk and it was a really heavy branch, then before we're done cutting it, it could end up falling and then tearing a bunch of bark from the trunk with it. That's not good. We want to avoid that. So for a larger branch, we would make our first cut a couple inches out or depending on the size of the branch, maybe even like a foot out from the trunk of the tree. And you would make that cut on the underside and go about halfway through. And then your second cut would be just past that first cut. And the way that one you would cut all the way through. So the first cut works as like a stop gap. So if you're making that second cut and the bark starts peeling away, it's going to stop peeling at that first cut it won't go all the way back to the trunk of the tree. So then once you've taken the bulk of the weight off, then you can make your final cut just outside of the branch collar. Then you won't have to worry about the tree like 
peeling all the bark right off the trunk. These are just some examples of good pruning cuts. It's a little easier to see the um, uh, the branch bark ridge. So right here, again, we cut, and here's the collar, like gets a little like bulge sort of thing. And you want to cut right outside of it. So again, the branch collar is like right there. These are at pruning cuts. Um, so as you can see, like they're way, in the case of the picture on the right, you would have wanted to go back a little bit closer. Um, and the picture on the left, you're again, way, 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 way too far out. Like you could have gone back several more inches um, to be just outside of the uh, branch bark ridge and the branch color. Uh, we don't want any nubs. So the multiple leaders, like I had mentioned earlier. So on the left is a picture of, you know, when it's young and you see the tree kind of starts to split. So like I would have taken off the one on, on the right because that one seems like it's not quite as big. Um, if we just take it off then, then the other one will just become the main trunk of the tree, no problems. On the right, we see what happens. It's not the same tree, but um, you can see what happens when that problem is not addressed when the tree is young. So now you've got a tree that's basically split in two, um, which is generally just not very good for balance. Uh, like one side of that tree is more likely to come down now. It's, you know, it's very unbalanced and fixing it at that point would definitely cause a lot of damage to the tree, if not like basically kill it because you would you'd have to take off like one of those entire trunks. And at that point, you might as well just take down the whole thing because it's probably gonna die. <laughs> so I mentioned crown raising before. So, you know, if it's blocking the stop sign, if it's in your yard and it's just too low, it keeps whacking you in the face, then it's okay to, to raise it up. Um, the trees grow from the top out. So when you take off the lower branches, they're not gonna regrow. And it's totally fine to do that. And we always want to prune um, at least a year after planting. Again, unless it's like something dead or diseased or like an immediate hazard. Um, so a year after you're planting, if you see some of the limbs are a little too low, just raise them up a little bit. And then again, you don't want to take off more than 25%. So if there's a lot, leave some for the next year and just every year come back and do a little bit more. So I'm sure that none of you are personally doing this because this is mostly utility companies, but please do not top trees. <laughs> this is very bad and I see it all the time. Uh, there's, I don't even know why these trees were topped because there's, I mean, the trees themselves are way above the electrical wires. Like they're not interfering with anything and yet they just beheaded them. So these trees are, you know, maybe gonna live for a little while, but they're, almost definitely gonna die within the coming years. So please don't do that. And also it looks very ugly. And then finally, we want to protect our trees. So no carving in the trees, trying to avoid like nailing and stapling stuff. Um, if you can, if you really need to hang something up, like maybe zip ties around the tree. Um, I you know tape wouldn't really work very well. You can put lights around your trees. We have a lot of residents um, in like Newark and Camden who over the winter will put Christmas lights on their trees and it makes the block look really nice. That's totally fine, nothing wrong with that. Just um, remove them before spring because that's when the trees grow. Or if you do wanna keep them on year round, just loosen them up because the trees will grow into the lights or the tie, whatever you have tied around the tree, they'll just grow around them. So just like remove them, you know, put them back on, like loosen them up a little bit so that they're not like choking out the tree. Again, like ornaments and birdhouses and stuff, totally fine to have them, but just be aware that the tree is growing and it will grow around these items uh, if you leave them in for too long. And that's not great for the tree. Um, I mentioned with the weed whackers and lawnmowers, try and stay away from them if you can. Like 
pull your weeds out by hand. Um, and mulch, if you're mulching around your tree, then you don't really have to worry about mowing close to it. So it's a win-win. Winter salt, um, if it's a street tree or if you've got a tree close to your driveway um, or your sidewalk, then try and avoid using salt around it. It's not great for the trees. Um, sand is okay though. And then if you live in an area with deer, use deer guards. Um, they will both eat the trees and like rub their horns on them. So you can buy things to protect from that. I know that they are definitely a big problem in South Jersey, so. You might need those. And then one last thing, just as like a PSA, if you haven't heard about these yet, um, the spotted lanternfly is our most recent well, uh, invasive species in the state. It's been here for a couple of years now. I don't know if it's gotten to Atlantic County yet. Um, it was really bad where I am in Camden County last year, you know, out by Philly. Uh, it's pretty, they're pretty bad. They came over from Asia on some shipping crates and they will eat pretty much any tree that there is. Particularly uh, fruit trees, they really like grapes and hops. Um, and these things literally just swarm on the trees. Like if you see them, you'll know they're everywhere. So they feed on the trees and as they feed, they like release um, this like sap and it ends up growing mold around the base of the tree, which attracts like wasps and bees as well, which is not great. But especially with um, fruit crops, then it ends up getting on the fruit and spoiling the fruit. So not good, we, we need to figure out what to do with these things. Um, the problem is that they are really, really good at hitchhiking. So they will lay their egg masses. And I have, a, I have a picture of their egg mass. Oh, actually on this picture, the leftmost one is their egg mass. It's not super clear, but they will lay their eggs on any outdoor surface. So cars, chairs, playground equipment, um, they don't discriminate. And then if they lay their eggs, you know, let's say like on the underside of your car, and then you drive to another county and then, you know, they hatch there, or maybe they were just like on the car. Um, now they're in that county. So we've got a bunch of uh, states in New Jersey that are already under quarantine. So in these counties, you're supposed to like check your cars before you leave the area, make sure that you're not accidentally transporting these things. Because once they get into an area, they, really just take over. It's very bad. So hopefully we can stop them sometime. Uh, the life cycle. So right now we are in the nymph stage or we're, we're about to be in the nymph stage. So egg masses literally just look like, they're really hard to notice, honestly. They're just like a little gray, a flat gray blob pretty much against a surface. Um, you can scrape them off. Like we have little cards like this, or you can use like a credit card um, or like your nail even, and just scrape them off, put them in a bag, um, kill them with um, hand sanitizer or alcohol. So you can do that all winter. But right now we're getting into the nymph stage. So you might start seeing the, like, they're, they're really small. Um, these little nymphs crawling everywhere. And then like late summer, you'll see them in the adult form. And they're pretty big actually. Like you, you definitely notice them when they're climbing all over your trees um, and they, they hop a lot. So they're really hard to smush. But if you see any, just kill them right away. Don't feel bad about it. <laughs> just stomp on them because we need to try and get rid of as many as we can. Um, they're definitely going to be a problem. Um, like I said, I don't know if they're in Atlantic County yet, but they surely will be. So that's just something to be aware of. And uh, that's it. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to you know, ask away.
Thanks so much, Crystal. That was great. We covered so much from, uh, you know, tree types and planting and maintenance is really terrific. And I know um, your Thank website you. has a lot more information, lists of trees and, um, you know, different, uh, different resources there. So I hope that people will go there too. And, uh, and the people will be able to watch this later on and uh, get all this good information. So I don't know if there's any questions. Um, uh, here, here's one. Um, why do you think that landscapers do that volcano thing with the mulch? Any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like in the tree world, among people who plant trees, like we all know that it's bad. Like it's something we all know. So, I mean, I think a lot of people think it looks nicer. Um, you know, like you're definitely not going to get any weeds poking through a foot of mulch. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, or or I think that they just want to charge more for mulch. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> that could be, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, I don't understand it. Like it's a well-known fact that that's not the way to do it, and they keep doing it. So. Yeah. And um, are there uh, good sources, and maybe it's on your website, good sources for uh, recommended um, places to get trees? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think we have anything on our website. Some local nurseries. I don't know exactly where Fernbrook is, but I think it's in the South Jersey area. Fernbrook Nursery, we get trees from sometimes. Pinelands Nursery is really good. Um, Hopewell Nursery is in... Bridgeton, I think. Um, they're they're definitely in in the southern area. So those are some really good nurseries that we use regularly. Um, but also, like I know, like there's the Galloway Nursery. Um, I know there's a bunch of garden centers in that area. Uh, I would just avoid like big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot because their trees probably aren't the best. Go to like a local, you know, locally run place. All right, and um, thank you, Adaria. She's um, sharing her thanks, and uh, she's going to pass this information on to the mayor of Bridgeton so oh. that uh, <laughs> they can get the right trees planted in town. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you're in Bridgeton, I'm pretty sure Hopewell is in Bridgeton, so go there. We like them. <laughs> All right, excellent. Good. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I thank you so much for your time, yeah, Crystal, you. and for sharing all this great information. Yeah, and um, I mean, my contact info is in the, the first slide. So if anyone, you know, has questions about trees or wants to come out and volunteer, I don't think um, the rest of our spring plantings, we have like plenty, plenty of volunteers, but we will be back in the fall if you ever want to come out to like one of our Camden ones. Uh, maybe we'll be in Atlantic City again at some point. So, yeah, that's fun. That was a good help us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks and happy Arbor Day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Arbor Day. All right. Take care. Bye.